He's one of my favorite people to work with, uh, and I'm thrilled to call him a friend. Mike Mayock joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Mike? Pretty good, Coach. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> You're the coach, man. I'm just I, you. Just tell me where to play. I, I'm also <laughs> I'm there so I don't get fined, Mike. I don't know about you. Just be on time, then. Uh, that's what I'll. <laughs> So coming into this combine, Mike, uh, I know you spoke for two hours and 45 minutes yesterday, so I appreciate you phoning in uh, to talk some more about it here on this program. What's the strongest group coming in, in your estimation? Uh, Rich, I, I'll tell you a, a quick synopsis of this year. I think the running back group is tremendous at the top end with depth throughout. I think the wide receivers, even though we had maybe the best wide receiver class in history, a year ago. This group is really good also. Uh, I think the groups that were a little thin are quarterback, tight end, and safety. So in terms of running backs, do you think we're going to actually see one chosen in the first round because they're so good? Or, or, or deep, we'll see a run on them second, third round like we have in the last few years, Mike? Well, I, I really think, and I'm probably going to contradict myself in about 30 seconds, but Gee. I I really think the second round for running backs is the old first round. And let, let me give you a couple names, for instance. Um, 2012 was the last time we had a first round running back, and there were three of them Trent Richardson, Doug Martin, and David Wilson. Okay? Now, one of them got hurt. The other two are actually two of them are really. I mean, there, there's no production out of that group outside of Doug Martin's first year. So. If you look at 2013, look at the second round. Giovanni Bernard, Le'Veon Bell, Monte Ball, and Eddie Lacy. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. And then last year, Bishop Sankey, Jeremy Hill, Carlos Hyde, all in the second round. So I think we're seeing what we've talked about for years, the, the devaluation of that position. However, and here comes the contradiction, this year we have two kids, Melvin Gordon, and Todd Gurley that have first grades every first round grades everywhere, and I have trouble thinking they won't go somewhere in the first round. Mike Mayock joining me here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's get into it. Jameis Winston, I know you told uh, Peter King that he scares you in a couple of ways. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jameis Winston? I haven't really started to take all the character stuff into account yet. Okay, I'm just watching tape and trying to stack players by position based on what I've seen on tape. Now, you have to live in a hole somewhere not to know his issues off the field. And I'm kind of uh, a little disappointed in myself from a year ago when I kind of, you know, and you know me, Rich, I'm a little bit conservative and, and that stuff matters to me. And I yep. kind of swept Johnny Manziel, well, oh, you know, maybe he's just immature. I think he's going to be okay. And, and, you know, that was against my own better judgment. And I hope I learned a lesson. So as we get closer and I learn more about what really did or didn't happen with his off-the-field stuff, you know, that could easily change. As far as on the field, you know, it, how many interceptions he throws, Rich, is unbelievable. I mean, I, if you look at the Louisville and Florida tape, he threw seven interceptions in the total in those two games. It could have been twice that if the other teams could catch. <laughs> However, he comes back in the second half. He has no conscience. He just comes back, and he just keeps making throw after throw. And, and I give him credit for that. You know, when, with the game on the line, he's his best. And you can see everything you want to see as far as a pocket quarterback in the NFL. And, you know, the other shoe is obviously um, the kid from Oregon. And, boy, I love everything about the kid. All the individual components work. Arm, feet, legs, athletic ability, intelligence, arm strength, everything. But he's a projection because he's going to be asked to play in a different system. Unless, of course, Philadelphia goes up and grabs him, as many people are talking about. And the fact that, as we are seeing as part of the combine, who's speaking to the media? Normally, virtually every coach and or team's general manager meets with the media. We're hearing that no one from the Eagles is scheduled to talk, and people are starting to connect some dots here that maybe Chip Kelly goes and grabs his kid from, from Oregon. What do you make of all this, Mike? Well, 
if we use RG3, and actually, let me take a step back. Philosophically, I have always said that there are only about 10 or 12 franchise quarterbacks in the league at any given time where you can bang the table and say they can win your Super Bowl. If that's the case and you don't have one of those 10 or 12, it behooves you to go figure out a way to get one, right? So Mm -hmm. that's the philosophical backdrop. Now, Philadelphia is sitting at 20, and I'm not sure what it would cost them to get from 20 up to say, five to get ahead of the Jets if he was there, but it might be prohibitive. It might be too much. We saw what the numbers were on the RG3 trade, and I'm just not sure you can get from 20 to five and still look your team in the eye and say, hey, we got a shot here. So you think the Jets would go get Mariota if he's sitting there at six? Well, look at it this way, Rich. It's a new general manager, a new head coach. There's never a better time to draft a franchise quarterback in that first year. It's a clean slate. You all start together in the same system. So first order of business for the Jets is to evaluate Geno Smith. And from what I've seen is the same thing I saw when he came out. Flashes of brilliance, but most of it isn't very good. And there's no consistency, and there was no pattern of consistent improvement. So that's my take. However, the new staff has to make their own take. And if they think, if Marcus Mariota is sitting there and they think he's a better he's a better prospect than whatever they have on their roster, yeah, they have to take him. So, as I'm talking to Mike Mayock here, uh, I want to keep extrapolating this out because it's, it's so juicy. And um, we're going to be talking about, we might as well, this is sort of like our meeting, Mike, because we're going to be talking <laughs> about this on Saturday for sure. What if, say, Mariota and or Winston is available when John Fox and Chicago, with Cutler sitting there, is on the clock. Do you think they pull the trigger for e- either one of these guys if they're available? Well, I think it's the same exercise for them, okay, which is, okay, one of those two quarterbacks is available. How do we see Jay Cutler as a, as a new organization? Do we believe in this guy or not? And if the answer is no, you got to pull the trigger. I think this is a different conversation, though. I mean, philosophically it's the same, but I think it's a different conversation than the one we just had about the Jets because I think Jake Cutler and Geno Smith are in completely different places. So what if what if they're available at um, either one of them at, at 10 for St. Louis, who we know has had so many opportunities to get a first-round quarterback with Sam Bradford still sitting there, who they have once again – publicly said, is their guy moving forward? Do you think St. Louis might take either one of those two guys, Jeff Fisher and Les Snead? Uh, it, that's a different conversation because I think they believe they have a franchise quarterback. He's just hurt all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, right? That's the issue, so, though. It, oh, it's a significant issue. It's a significant, significant issue. If their doctors tell him he's no more liable to get hurt going forward, it's not a continuing issue, blah, 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 blah. I think they feel like they have their guy. But it's the same conversation. If anybody in the draft, especially at the most important position on the team, if anybody in that draft tells you we've got a better shot at winning with him at quarterback than anybody on our roster, then yes, you have to take them. But I think it's that's a tougher one because they already feel like they've got the guy, he's in the system, and they can win now as opposed to, worrying about two years from now. Is Leonard Williams the best player in the draft, in your estimation, he, USC D lineman? He, he's on the top four, five, six, seven, yeah. You, you, know, I'm, you know I'm not going there right now, Rich. Oh, I know, but I'd like to there, fish there's for There's a him. lot of time left. So how, good yeah, is, so how good is this kid? Is he, does he have uh, – what, what are you looking – let's put it this way then. When he gets out there Sunday, what are you looking to see on, from Leonard Williams? Richard Seymour. Okay. Who went, was the sixth pick overall by New England became one of the most dominant five techniques that defensive end in the three four, and the thing about Seymour is you can play him anywhere up and down the line of scrimmage. And the thing about Leonard Williams is you can line them up in any front, in any place along that front, and he has the potential to be an All Pro. So that's how special he is. Who's the kid you haven't seen that much tape on that you're looking forward to giving the eyeball test to in person this weekend, Mike? Well, I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a somebody who. Not many people know that I think a lot of the scouts are interested in, in eyeballing. 
His name's Gene Sifrin. He's a tight end from UMass. And he kind of had a circuitous route to get there. He, he was out of football for five years, taking care of his son coming out of high school. Hmm. So he's 27 years old. He's been in three different colleges, sat out for five years, played basketball. He's 6'7", 250. One of his catches this year was featured on SportsCenter because it was so sick. And the guy's got that, you know, that basketball up, incredible wingspan, really good hands, has no clue what he's doing as a football player, but he looks like a baby <laughs> colt, you know, just all arms and legs and athletic ability. Yeah, so, for, for someone who's 27, a baby colt, that's fascinating. Yeah, because he doesn't know how to play football, but he, he's intriguing just because of his length and his athletic ability and his natural hands. Very rare to see somebody make Brandon Whedon seem like a like a baby child, Mike. <laughs> the combo. You know, you there think, you go. Good when pull. You, when you think of it, hey, listen, I'm just getting ready just to try to sit next to you. Um, so, what? Just one last macro question before we get to the the most important run, Mike. That we, you know, where I was going to ask you about. Um, yeah. what, what does what does the combine mean, Mike? For so many fans who are just wondering, what what does it mean? What does it mean in the evaluation process? What it should mean is. It's a cross check, and it's just a part of the process. And I tell people all the time that the tape is probably 85% of your grade, and the, the scouts come in there, and the general manager comes in there, and they expect to see certain times and measurements based on what you've already seen on tape. And, Rich, you've heard me say a thousand times fast guys run fast, slow guys run slow. It's only a story when the opposite occurs. Mm -hmm. So, if I see a wide receiver who I think is a 4-5 guy, you know, let's say Kevin White is my number one wide receiver, okay? I think he's a 4-5-0 guy on tape. If he comes out and runs 4-6-1, which is what Kelvin Benjamin ran a year ago, then I got a problem. I got to go back to my tape and reevaluate and say, am I off or is the kid a faster player or – What's going on? So to me, it's a cross check. It raises certain red flags if a guy runs or jumps or doesn't look as good or or looks better than you expected, and you got to go back and grind the tape again. But we all get carried away with the numbers, and I think that's where mistakes are made. Last question, Mike. What are you hearing about my run, Mike? What are you hearing about my chances to break my personal best that you personally hand time every year? What are you hearing? Just lay it out, unvarnished. Uh, I heard that you were retiring after breaking 6 0. Nope. Unfortunate to hear that. That was the buzz. I choose to run, Mike. I'm still running. I mean, you might have been speaking to my wife. You might have been speaking to Susie, who, as you know, wants me to, you know, retire on top, sort of walk off Elway, Betta, Strahan like. Dude, I thought that was the move. I really did. <laughs> You conquered it. Yeah. You did it. You yep. did it legit. It got bigger and better every year. Yep. People were sending in videos, and I thought, you know what? It is time for Eisen to just pack that stuff up yep. and, and drive off into the sunset. So that said, Mike, uh, I've, yeah. cut, I've cut weight. Uh, I'm getting advice from uh, Chris Johnson, Brandon Cooks. Next, uh, uh, tomorrow's show, Dre Archer, Don Beebe. I'm getting some advice. I, I really think, and, and I don't know if you know, if I break 5'8", my average time since turning 40 would be under six seconds after breaking six seconds just once last year. So just that, uh, that's my goal here, Mike. And I, I love the positive vibe, and I hate to be <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, but, I mean, what happens if you go 6'3", 6'? Yeah. Oh, now, I know. now what? Where do we go from there? Well, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet, right, Mike? You know, you just got to put it out there. You got to run the risk. Dude, fa father time's undefeated. <laughs> and you're, and you're, you're, dancing, you're dancing with that. I just want okay. you to be aware. All right. Well, once again, in advance, um, I appreciate it. Uh, I know, you know, it's sort of like that, that Rodney Dangerfield line from Caddyshack, keep it fair. Keep it fair. <laughs> you're the one with the finger on the trigger. So just uh, keep it fair. That's all I ask. I know you and will. that's all you'll get. <laughs> you won't even ask any other questions. Mike, I'll see you in Indy. Thanks again. Looking forward to a pal. You got a pal. That's uh, Mike Mayock. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience.